It's your Catholic Drive Time. With Joe McLean and Emily Alcaraz. But with all that said, joining us right now by Zoom is the uh, the one and only great Gabriel Castillo from Gabby After Hours. Good morning, Gabriel. Good morning, sir. How are you? Praise God I'm alive, and it's so good to be on with you. Thank you for taking the time to be on our show today. It's my pleasure. My pleasure, of course, to talk about the Blessed Virgin. I'll do anything. <laughs> you are a slave of the Immaculata, and that's what I love about yes. you most, I think. Um, and she, even though I'm a slave, she pays me well. She gives me a lot of grace. <laughs> Well, praise be to Jesus. Let's start by uh, plugging uh, Gabby After Hours, uh, you, your YouTube channel. You've been on YouTube for quite a long time. You've done such really incredible, and, and it gets more beautiful every single day. Tell us wow. about the nature of your programming there, and maybe what's up your sleeve coming down in 2021. So we've got a lot coming down in 2020. The inspiration for all of this, obviously, is the theology of Maximilian Kolbe, that we can spread the Immaculata to the ends of the earth and bring Jesus Christ to the world as soon as possible. Possible. And we do that using the best technology available to us. And so for 2021, we have I have a lecture that I'm posting in the next couple of days on the way of Mary. Then we have an epic uh, documentary called Testimonies of the Rosary for Men. We have a video coming out on spiritual warfare. We have uh, a program where we're going to make a home enthronement program with images that people can download so that they can enthrone their own homes uh, virtually, but really, truly, by doing the holy water themselves, doing the prayers themselves. And we've got a lot of other great programs coming down the way. So you should subscribe there at Gabi After Hours. And the easiest way to, because you're like, what is this Gabi? How do you spell Gabi? That's a weird name. You can just go to <laughs> www.truefaith.tv, and then you can find out more information there. Truefaith.tv. We'll, of course, post links to it uh, along with this video as well. So truefaith.tv, or just search for Gabi, G A B I after yeah. hours on YouTube. You'll find it. I promise you'll be blown away. It'll be amazing. Let's talk about Our Lady and let's talk about uh, her being the mother of God. In the last hour, we spoke with Tim Staples, uh, sort of a well-known Catholic apologist working for Catholic Answers about the, the biblical defense and the history behind uh, the church's teaching on Our Lady as mother of God. I, I want to turn to you and maybe talk more about the uh, the spiritual side of it or the practical yes. side of how do we live our lives as uh, yes. Our Lady being the mother of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Well, I, I want to first mention why. Right now, we're living in a time where it feels as if the church church is going through a great mediocrity and a great failure. But if you look throughout the history of the church and the history of salvation, the ones who were the greatest, the ones who were the most heroic were the most Marian, starting with Jesus himself. You couldn't get any more Marian than Jesus. He gave himself totally over to the Virgin Mary. St. Joseph, this is the year of St. Joseph. He was completely consecrated to the Virgin Mary. St. John the Apostle, St. John Paul II, St. Paul, all of the greats were heroically Marian, and they derive their strength from Mary. So if people are living a mediocre lives, the first place they should check is, where's, where's Mary in my life? A lot of times people make a Marian consecration, and they say, well, what is Mary going to do for me? Because Mary's got a lot of power. She's got a lot of privileges. But because of Mary's power, we should be saying, what should I do for Our Lady? Sometimes we think, well, Mary's my mother. She's my queen. My mom will do this, that, and the other thing, and she'll do Mary many things for us. But Jesus, the perfect model of Marian devotion, would, as a good child, would say, Mary, what do you want of me? And so that's very important. And sadly, through the Protestant Reformation, according to Maximilian Kolbe, a great theologian, as you know, he would say that one of the worst, there's many bad things that happened because of the Protestant Reformation, but one of the devil's most insistent snares that he has spread through Protestantism is our second guessing our relationship with the Virgin Mary and causing us to doubt how much we can love Mary. And he would go on to say that nobody can love Mary more than Jesus did. He loved her perfectly. And if we were to take a look at scripture, just briefly, I know you had an amazing apology, Tim Staples on earlier, but it's important that we realize that if we're looking at scripture objectively, from the very beginning, this is about a man and a woman, Adam and Eve, and at the Proto-Evangelium in Genesis 3.15, God the Father says to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. And obviously, first and foremost, that offspring is Jesus Christ. But we find out according to John, who is one of the greatest of all the Marian devotees in the book of uh, the gospel of John, that the woman is Mary. And at the foot of the cross, Jesus says to John and Jesus says to Mary, woman, behold your son. So we're associating the Virgin Mary 
with Mary, with the new Eve. And then again, John in the book of Revelation in, Gen in Revelation 12, 17, it says that the serpent went off to make war against the woman and her offspring. And those offspring, according to the book of Revelation, are those who hold to the Ten Commandments and give testimony to Jesus Christ. So we are all Mary's offspring. And we first and foremost have to accept that because we are in a spiritual war. And it's a war that's been throughout, that's sown throughout scripture from the very beginning to the very end. And if you want to win the war, you have to be on the side of the Virgin Mary. And as you well know, Maximilian Colby was famous for saying that the Immaculata alone has a promise from God to crush the head of the serpent. And so as Mary, mother of God, that means a lot of things for us spiritually so all of our dogmas they have consequences and so because mary is the mother of god according to saint alphonsus whatever belongs to the king also belongs to the queen and so and he all saint alphonsus would also say every Everybody obeys the Virgin Mary. All of nature obeys the Virgin Mary. And even God obeys the Virgin Mary. When Jesus submitted himself to the will of the Virgin Mary by becoming her son, because he's a perfect son, his, his life was one of absolute obedience to the Virgin Mary. So you have Emily, you have Adrian Fonseca working there on the radio station. They're great children, but they're not perfect children. They don't follow their mother in absolutely every single whim. Jesus was absolutely obedient to her, would do whatever she asked. And so that carrying over, that obedience carries over into the spiritual realm as well. So St. Alphonsus would even go on to say, to go this far, that Mary, you can consider Mary omnipotent, not by nature, because God is omnipotent by nature, but by grace as a gift that she can have whatever she wants and God will always say yes. And she never asks for anything that God doesn't want. And this is played out beautifully in the Gospel of John, where John calls, what Jesus himself calls Mary woman. And we see the woman interceding on behalf of those who are helpless. And Jesus goes on to say that it's not my hour, but he does it anyway. So we have in Mary, and Maximilian Colby would call her an an omnipotent advocate so we, so she in a way she's omnipotent in the way that she can tug on the heart of god the father because she's a perfect daughter because on the way that jesus the perfect son obeys mary who's the perfect and most loving mother and she's the perfect spouse so the holy spirit is constantly listening to her so also we also believe that mary is is the mediatrix of all grace. And so the theologians teach us that we all receive actual grace, which is the grace that God gives us at every moment to do his will. So some people will say, well, how is Mary present to me? How can I have, how intimately is this relationship taking place? It is so intimate that if God is giving you every single grace through the Virgin Mary, and at every single moment you're receiving actual grace, that means at every single moment, the mother of God is with you. At every single moment, the mother of God is watching you. And all you have to do is call upon her name and ask her, Mary, how can I be a beautiful child to you? And Mary will do, yes, it's true that we should do a lot for Mary, but Mary will do so many things for you. We, we all, one of the most common questions I'm sure you get on your program is, my son, my daughter, they've left the church. How can I help to save their souls? Or people, one of the biggest uh, fears that people have besides public speaking is death. How can Mary help me at the hour of my death? When you give your life over completely to the Virgin Mary, you give her all of your worries, you give her your, your children, you give her your spouse, you give her your fear of death or whatever your fears might be. She takes those as her own. Now, mm -hmm. so you're worried about your child converting. You're saying, Mary, I give you my life. She takes your child and she loves your child more than you do. So any, any client, any child of the Virgin Mary, in so far as they are being true children, not just asking her for things, but trying to do her will, trying to hold to the testimony of Christ, trying to live the Ten Commandments, she will not forsake them and she will not forsake their intentions. There's some stories in the book, The Glories of Mary by St. Alphonsus, where a mother was interceding on behalf of her son and her son, who was a, a sinful man, ended up being saved and devils were complaining that they didn't even get a fair trial. This person deserved damnation, but because they had interceded on the, with the mother of God, they didn't even get a fair trial because the devils is a, is like a strong lawyer. So it was completely, uh, completely a waste for him. So we have to go to the Virgin Mary. 
One of the things that most people are struggling with, and uh, the uh, famous exorcist from Rome, Father Gabriel Lamorth, would say that many young people are struggling with the devil in the realm of lust, in the realm of temptation towards impurity. And St. Alphonsus also teaches us that the name of Mary is synonymous with purity. If you call, every time you call upon the name of Mary, you're more pure than the second before. Every time you call it upon the name of Mary, you're more humble than you were the moment before. Well, because an act of humility is asking for help. And so Mary is, we're asking Mary for help and she's helping us with that. St. Alphonsus would also say that if you're struggling with impurity and you don't know if you sin, you're there in the heat of the moment, the temptations are raging, you're feeling the burning in your chest that you want to commit a sin. If you've called upon the name of Mary and you're not sure whether you committed the act or not, that St. Alphonsus says, then you can be assured that you did not commit this sin. And if you found that you actually did commit the act, if you call upon the name of Mary and your immortal sin, you won't remain in mortal sin very much longer because one of a mother's jobs as mother of God, mother of man, mother of Christians, is to make sure that they return to the state of grace as soon as possible. We're talking with Gabriel Castillo from Gabi After Hours on uh, YouTube. And we're talking about Mary as the mother of God. And that's a powerful testimony there, Gabriel. Thank you uh, for sharing that deep insights. And I want to say that most of us probably don't spend a lot of time reading St. Alphonsus Liguori. And right. a couple of things that I was thinking about when you were talking about that is how difficult the subject really is, especially for non-Catholics, but even mm -hmm. for Catholics that aren't very well studied in their faith. And, uh, you know, yeah. uh, like, for instance, uh, that Mary is omnipotent, not by nature, but by grace. I think of John chapter 15, uh, you know, the vine and the branches. The vine is Christ. We are the branches and the branches connected to that vine on earth. Uh, we're connected to the same vine, whether we're on earth or in the beatific vision. It's the yes. it's the vine that connects the church. And it is through that vine that this grace is communicated and, and given to each and every one of us. And so what a powerful gift and what an awesome God we have that he would give us a mother yeah. like Mary. But I know, Emily, you had a question for uh, for uh, uh, Gabriel Castillo today. Right. Uh, so holiday season, a lot of people are going back and forth from home. I'm going to give you a question you've mm. never heard before. Do Catholics worship Mary? Yes. What's the answer for the <laughs> those who are being asked this by the... You'd be surprised. This is the most frequently asked question I see on social media. Somehow it just no, comes up we, we over and over again. Obviously, we absolutely do not worship Mary, but the amount of honor we give her doesn't even come close to a fraction of coming to what she deserves, which is still nowhere close to worshiping her. <laughs> yeah, that's a, really, so, that's a really great point because... I think we are often, uh, we, we kind of, when we have this idea of that we're worshiping Mary and not giving the due worship to God, I think the problem that people are having with this is, one, we're not thinking of God highly enough, one, and yeah. two, and because we're not thinking of highly enough of God, we think that our love and our adoration and our uh, and our love of, uh, of God is limited to the yes. proportion of which we give our love out to other people. But it's the same way that you would say, like, I love my parents, for instance. If I love my mom 100%, that doesn't mean I'm taking away love for my father. Uh, if I love my mom 100%, I can still yes. give 100% of love to my father in the same way we do with our mother. Now, I have, I have a question. Let me, let me Go ahead. Let me add this to that, because I think every Christian, even a Protestant would admit that the essence of holiness is union with Jesus Christ. All we desire in life is to be one with God. In heaven, we're going to be one with God. The more Marian you are, that means the more you entrust yourself to the Virgin Mary, the more united to Christ you are. The more, you, the more she becomes your mother, the more you try to please her, the more Jesus-like you become. And that's why St. Alphonsus says that no child of Mary shall ever be lost because that is the very most basic way that you can be united to Christ is to have the same mother. We're talking with uh, Gabriel Castillo from Gabby After Hours. You know, I was also just thinking about, you know, this question about uh, do, we, do, do Catholics worship Mary? And what you were saying there about we don't give her enough. I, you know, one of my favorite uh, Renaissance artists is uh, Caravaggio. And oh, one of the reasons why I love his paintings is because the use of light. He was His use of light and detail was so dynamic that it really makes mm -hmm. that image almost feel lifelike. And you can sit there and ponder on these images and just just be lost in them somewhat. The artist himself 
would have never felt if he was standing next to this image and I'm just like ignoring him and paying attention to this beautiful piece of artwork, this Caravaggio artwork, he wouldn't be offended that I would pay no attention to him. Yeah. He wouldn't be offended that I was looking lovingly and, and, and just in awe of the art and the skill and the image and the, and the message and the emotion that's communicated through yes. his craft, through his skill. How much more would that be true for God who created he, the most think, perfect he, mother possible for his son? If you think about musicians, you go to a music concert and they're playing their most beautiful masterpiece, it would be an insult for you not to stand up and clap after they played their best hit. Yeah, 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 true story. If you're, by the way, fun fact, if you're in China and you're eating at a meal and you don't belch afterwards, the chef is insulted because you didn't yes. compliment them. True story. At any rate, we're talking about the mother of God with Gabriel Castillo, Gabi After Hours. We have about, uh, I don't know, six or seven minutes left in our conversation with him about the mother of God, maybe we can turn to what is the best way to mark this day? I mean, we go to Holy Mass. Okay, uh, I, I have a, it, yes. But go ahead. What, what, what would you offer us as to so a way have, to, to I have really commemorate? Three, I have three practical ways. Because we are incarnational, we need to do things physically. It's not enough to simply, it is good to harbor a love for Mary in your heart, but we should do things concretely. First, I would say, if you're not wearing a brown scapular, go buy a brown scapular and enroll yourself. Find a priest to enroll you in the brown scapular. Pope Pius XII said that the wearing the brown scapular is the manifestation of consecration to Mary. It's a manifestation of setting yourself aside as a child of Mary. When you think about what Jesus, the second person of the Holy Trinity did, he became flesh. He literally took on 100% of the DNA of the Virgin Mary. He clothed himself with his flesh, with her, with her blood that flowed through his body. And so too, when we wear the brown scapular, it's like we're putting on her clothes, we're putting on her flesh, we're putting on her protection. So I would say first and foremost, wear a brown scapular, get a brown scapular. You'll notice I'm wearing a miraculous medal. It's another beautiful devotion that Mary actually promised graces. So the first was the brown scapular. She promised that nobody who wears a scapular would suffer eternal fire. Again, because that makes you a child of the Virgin Mary. It makes you united to Christ. But Mary also promised to Catherine Labore in 1830 that those who wore the miraculous medal, which is, if you look at it, it's Mary in theology because it has Mary crushing the head of the serpent. On the back, it has Mary at the foot of the cross. It's got the 12 stars. It's got the heart of Jesus and the heart of Mary side by side. The heart of Mary uh, pierced by a lance. It's like the, the little gospel or the little uh, catechism of Mary in theology there. And that those who wore it around the neck, especially with confidence, would experience great graces. And then finally, on the Feast of the Mother of God, if you are a child of Mary, you absolutely, besides going to Mass, you absolutely, even for those who are homebound, you absolutely must pray the Holy Rosary. Because if we're going to be obedient children of Mary, at, at all of the major Marian apparitions that have happened in the past 200 years, Mary has consistently said, pray the rosary every day. So you cannot call yourself an obedient child of Mary if you're not praying at least one rosary every single day. So those would be my advice to how to honor the mother of God is by kill yourself, kill yourself will. Because uh, our Lord said, take up your cross and follow me. The rosary for many people is boring. I fall under that category most of the time. And so every time we pray the rosary, it's a little, a little death to myself and a little yes to God, a little fiat saying, yeah, here I am. I'm giving you my time. I'm giving you my space. I'm going to give you my mind and I'm going to think about your mysteries for a little while. I'll never forget one of my uh, my confirmation saying my one of my patron saints is Saint Padre Pio, and there was this uh, time where he was very ill. He, he, many many times in his life, he was very very ill, and uh, he would run 114 degree temperatures. He'd break horse thermometers all the time. One such time, there was a visiting statue of Our Lady, and she had to be brought in by helicopter, and he wasn't able to come down and to spend time with Our Lady at, with the statue, and uh, and they were taking her away. And he went to the window and he he begged her to come back. And she miraculously came back and he was able to spend time. And this is a guy who would pray, I can't tell you how many rosaries per day, but way more than I do anyway. So in the last next uh, four minutes left in our program with you, Gabriel, uh, we had you on before to talk about rosaries. But I, wanna, I want you to maybe recap some of the best practices for praying the rosary. Some of us only pray five mysteries a day. Is that OK or should we be praying yes. more? So St. Louis de Montfort says that it's not even a venial sin not to pray the rosary. And, but I would caveat that with 
how many sins would you avoid if you did pray the rosary? So when the rosary was originally introduced, we often forget that Mary called it the angelic Psalter, referring to the 150 Hail Mary, uh, 150 prayers in the book of Psalms, there was 150 Hail Marys. And the Psalter or the liturgy of the hours used to be broken up for priests and religious through, and still is broken up throughout the day. And so to the rosary originally was intended to be all of the mysteries broken up throughout the day in the morning. So you have morning prayer, you have midday prayer and you have evening prayer. So a lot of times we feel like the rosary is not working and that could be because we're not praying the entire rosary, which all of the promises were associated with. Now, at Fatima, Our Lady requested the rosary. And there are some that say that in Portugal, the, the, the kids were using the word terca, which means a third or something to that effect. I don't speak Portuguese. So praying even just five decades is good. But if you really need maximum prayer power, you can pray more. So tips if you're going to pray all of the mysteries of the rosary is that only do the Apostles' Creed, etc. first in the morning. And then that begins the longer prayer. You don't have to do that over again. If you're going to pray, and many people, uh, they don't even know that you can pray more. You could pray the <laughs> same mystery. If it's like, so during Christmas, I've been praying the joyful mysteries multiple times a day just to remind myself of that Christmas spirit. You can do them in chronological order. You could do the joyful. You could do the luminous. You could do the sorrowful. You could do the glorious. If you're somebody who, for some reason, you just want to do the joyful, the sorrowful, and the glorious, you could do those. It, there's really no hard and fast rules. What makes the rosary powerful is that it's sacred scripture. So that's Holy Spirit power there. You're meditating upon the life of Christ. That's the life of Christ. Not only are you thinking about it, but you're encountering Christ. And it, you're, you're praying the Hail Mary, which is the cornerstone of the New Testament. That's where it all began with Mary's yes. And too often we forget that the theology of Mary being our uh, mediatrix of all grace was because of her yes. When she said yes, that's when she became the mother of God and the child Jesus is in her womb. So really the Hail Mary, if, if you're trying to please the mother of God, there's no more beautiful words that you can, you can say than Ave Maria. So that would be my tip. Break it up throughout the day. Don't beat yourself up over it. A lot of times people say, I'm not good at the rosary. Nobody is good at thinking of about more than one thing at a time. So you can either focus on the mysteries or you can focus on the words. Just if you've prayed 10 Hail Marys or you, you lost track and it's been a while, just move on to the next decade and keep moving forward. You don't have to just keep restarting and restarting and restarting and frustrating yourself. You just keep moving forward through, with your prayers throughout the day as if you were praying the Liturgy of the Hours, for example. But you will experience extraordinary, extraordinary graces. I have seen so many young people especially, come through various addictions, whether that be sins of the flesh, whether that be addictions to their phones and technology. Mary has a way, once you accept her as your mother, she has a way of making you a good child. She treats you well, but at the same time, a mother with good children, she knows how to discipline them in just the right way. All right. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Gabriel Castillo from Gabby After Hours on YouTube. Thank you so much for being on us on with us today. And Sharing such beautiful joy. insight Thank into you. the mother of God. God bless you. God love you. And happy new year you, to you friend. and your family. Thank you for joining us on Your Catholic Drive Time, where it is our pleasure to keep you informed and inspired. Join us Monday through Friday at the same time, right here on your favorite Catholic radio station. Don't forget to connect with us. Just go to facebook.com forward slash Catholic Drive Time. Again, that's facebook.com forward slash Catholic Drive Time. Be sure to share more than just us today. Share Jesus with everyone you meet. Bye now, and God love you.